For the 10th lecture for Geography 136, I'm going to be covering topics in terrain and surface analysis. They're basically all sorts of tools that we can use that all kind of stem from elevation data. And these are really useful for creating a whole bunch of different types of derived data. So we're going to look at like just starting with basic elevation data. What are different things you can do with that data to get cool and useful outputs? So this lecture is split into two major topics. One is an expanded introduction into elevation data. Uh, what kind of elevation data is out there? What are some characteristics of it? We touched on this earlier uh, in like the fourth week when we were talking about places to obtain data and different types of data. We're going to go a little bit more in depth into how this data is collected, where to find it, what type of data exists, and what are some important characteristics to keep in mind when using elevation data. Then for the second part of this lecture, I'm going to go into a little more depth about the analysis types that rely predominantly on this elevation data. And these generally fit into two categories that I'm going to cover. There are analysis tools. These are things that you run over an elevation data set and they give you some um, analytical output that creates a new layer that has some sort of data attached to it. And then the second set of tools that you can use elevation data for fit into a category which I'd call visualization tools. These are tools that just um, use that elevation data to let you um, create a cool visualization of the landscape. So elevation is a really important variable to have information about because it's related to a wide array of processes in the real world. Elevation over a surface relates to the direction that water flows over that surface. So you might be able to define which areas might flood based on how water flows. Um, you can define the location where sunlight hits. So like hill slopes facing in different directions get a different amount of sunlight. That's all related to an elevation surface. This might also connect to where different species live. So if you're doing analysis in biology, you can take this elevation on data and just use that to try to figure out where different species live, particularly plant species, where they're kind of sensitive to which direction the slope is facing and how much sunlight they get. But elevation isn't just an important variable for looking at uh, natural data or biological data. It's also really important for different types of social or economic data analysis. So elevation affects the cost of construction. It's usually probably cheaper to build something on flat ground than on a steep hill. Um, so if you're calculating costs at a construction zone, you might want to know the elevation within that zone to figure out how much that construction is going to cost. You can, by looking at the slope in an area, uh, figure out the difficulty of ski slopes or hiking trails or how challenging those might be to, to walk up or ski down. And you can calculate things like urban runoff, which comes with pollution. So uh, try to figure out where different sources of pollution are, where those are going to run based on the uh, water flow in that area. So terrain modeling or figuring out the um, elements of the terrain in a place, like elevation in different places, slope in different places, aspect, these are all a common GIS undertaking. We usually use what's called a digital elevation model or a DEM to model the landscape, but there are other ways of modeling the landscape as well. We also have a TIN or a triangulated irregular network. This is where we have sampled elevation points that are connected in vector format. So that's this example in the middle here and also the example shown on the top right right there. You have data for a number of specific points and you basically connect lines between them and create these irregularly sized surfaces that um, are triangles between three points that make this connected surface of what the elevation is approximately like over an area. From either a TIN or a DEM, you can create contour lines too. This is another way of modeling or representing uh, elevation in a place. Contour lines are lines of equal elevation. So you need some original data on elevation, and then you can create contour lines to show that elevation in, uh, in a map. Contour lines are usually used in uh, the cartographic context, so they help you visualize the landscape. They're not as useful for further analysis based on the elevations in a place. They're useful in looking at an area and getting a good idea of what that uh, landscape actually looks like, kind of translating the um, a map or the data you see on the, your screen to a, a 3D model of the real world. So to create any of these types of data models, either contour lines or DEMs or TINs, 
you have to ultimately obtain some sort of primary data about elevations along Earth's surface. There have been many ways that these models have been created over time and that the data has been collected to create these different types of models. So one of the earlier types of getting information about elevation was through the use of stereo images and photogrammetry. This is where you'd have an airplane flying over an area. You take two pictures from a slightly different location and by having those overlapping photos, you're actually able to see elevation. Uh, you kind of get a 3D image, and that 3D image can be translated to estimates of what the actual elevation is in different places. More recently, satellites and space shuttles have been used to measure elevation. So there have actually been space shuttle missions where a space shuttle flies up, uh, goes into orbit around the Earth, and while it's in orbit, it's using radar, or basically these radio pulses that bounce off Earth's surface and um, back towards that space shuttle. The space shuttle can measure the time it took for that radio pulse to bounce back, uh, thereby measuring how far that radio pulse traveled. That'll give you slight differences um, in elevation based on how long that radio pulse took to come back. We also have a more recent technology called LIDAR, and this can be implemented either using an airplane in an aerial survey over larger areas, or drones over pretty small areas. And this is similar conceptually to radar. It's something we'll talk more about in a couple weeks. And if you take the remote sensing class, we'll talk a lot more about it. Um, but basically, LIDAR is where laser pulses instead of radio waves are shot down from a moving plane or drone. And those laser pulses bounce back off Earth's surface, back up to that plane or um, that drone, thereby figuring out how far that distance on the ground is from that plane. A lot of early elevation data actually came from converted topographic maps or field surveys. People actually went out with surveying equipment and used uh, that surveying equipment to figure out how much higher certain areas were compared to other areas. You could take those topographic maps into GIS and using some of those methods we talked about earlier, digitizing or heads up digitizing, you can convert those elevations on the, the map or on other surveying data sets into elevation. So these are all different ways. They all have pluses and minuses. Some work at large scales, some work at small scales. Some would be really expensive. Like you obviously can't fly a drone over the entire US to get a, a really strong data set for the US. But drones are really useful for large scale mapping like a construction site, something like that. Whereas something like a space shuttle or a satellite can collect a lot of data over large areas, but um, it's generally not as high a quality of data. The resolution's worse and a lot of times there's errors or artifacts in that data. So just looking at a couple of these specific platforms, these are a few of the um, most useful, most used data collection platforms for creating DEMs that we have all used in uh, different labs and will use further in this lab. So one of the uh, most used sources for DEM data is called ASTER. This is a satellite platform. Uh, ASTER stands for Advanced Spaceborne Thermal Emission and Reflection Radiometer. You really don't have to know what that acronym stands for. It's a very complex one. But it's a satellite that was sent up to collect all sorts of data. One of these sorts of data that was collected uh, via radar was elevation data on Earth's surface. A second really common source of global DEM data is uh, via a space shuttle, specifically SRTM. That stands for Shuttle Radar Topography Mission. And this was a mission where the space shuttle was sent up specifically to collect this data on elevation for the entire world. So over the span of just about a week and a half, the space shuttle uh, circled around the Earth and collected elevation data using, again, radar methods, kind of similar to ASTER, however, from a space shuttle now, to collect elevation data along Earth's surface. Again, LIDAR is becoming more commonly used, and currently the U.S. government, as we'll see in a couple slides, is collecting LIDAR data for the entire U.S., hoping to improve on these earlier missions like ASTER and SRTM. Um, LIDAR is usually employed for the purposes of making a DEM via an airplane. You can put a LIDAR unit on a drone or use LIDAR in a whole bunch of different ways, but for the purposes of creating a digital elevation model over pretty large areas, it's still usually deployed from an airplane. So LIDAR, again, similar conceptually to radar, except in this case, we're shooting out little laser pulses that hit off objects on the ground or the ground itself 
the laser pulse bounces back to the airplane, and by measuring the time it takes for that pulse to return to the airplane, we can see how far the airplane is from the ground. All of these require really high quality GPS data to say exactly where the plane, satellite, or space shuttle is, and to calculate those uh, the distances that either the radio wave or the laser pulse was sent out from that um, platform. So looking at these different platforms, some of the data that you get, like LiDAR data coming from a drone, you'd only use those at the scale of a, a single project at a pretty small extent. For larger scale analysis, you'll probably get raster DEMs from publicly available government sources, or uh, sometimes maybe from commercial sources that have data over large areas as well. So there's a few important sources or data sets to know about. One of the oldest data sets that's still available and still useful for some parts of the world is the GTOPO30. Uh, the 30 stands for 30 arc second. A lot of times resolution is described in an angular unit instead of a, uh, in meters or kilometers or miles, but 30 arc second basically corresponds to about one kilometer resolution. So this data set has um, global coverage from the USGS. If you wanna make like a, a global map with some element of elevation in it, this would be pretty good to use because it, it's not super data intensive. If you're using really high resolution data um, at large spatial extents, like over the whole world, that would make your map and analysis run really slowly. So it's still really useful even though the resolution isn't super high. Then SRTM, I already mentioned SRTM. This was that space shuttle mission in 2000. That generated 30 meter resolution data for the US and it's generally pretty good quality data. It also has a 90 meter resolution data set for the entire world that came from the space shuttle mission. Another data set is that Aster GDEM, again, global DEM, has one arc second data. Again, arc second translated into the units we usually use is about 30 meter resolution data. Uh, the Aster global DEM covers the entire world from 84 degrees north to 84 degrees south. It's the vast majority of all land area at this 30 meter resolution. So this is a data set where you can really go to kind of anywhere in the world and get relatively high quality data. And again, that 30 meters, that's especially useful because it lines up with the Landsat data that we have for the last uh, 30 or 40 years for everywhere on Earth. For most of the US, that SRTM data and the Aster data is pretty similar. Um, they're, they're both at 30 meter resolution for the entire US. There are a few differences in data quality. We'll see that some of these uh, DEMs that have been created have a certain type of artifact where data got reported back slightly in an incorrect way. It's generally agreed upon that SRTM data is a little bit easier to correct. There's fewer of these artifacts or systematic errors that result in that data. So if you get the choice of SRTM or Aster, it might be worth looking at both if you're looking for that 30 meter data, but a lot of times that SRTM data will be a little easier to correct and just better quality overall. A more recent global data set for elevation is called World DEM. I haven't actually seen any of this data firsthand, I just saw that this exists. Um, and this is 12 meter resolution, so quite a bit higher resolution than SRTM or Aster um, for the entire world. However, this is a commercial data set. That means some company owns it. They own the copyright to it. If you want to get an area on Earth at 12 meter resolution from this world DEM data set, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Now we have the 3D elevation program. This is the official US government program through the USGS that's combining data from all these data sources to basically come up with the best possible coverage for every location in the US. So through the 3D elevation program, if you search for their data, now they've actually gotten things down to 10 meter resolution for all of the US and an increasing number of areas have even better one meter resolution collected with uh, airplanes and LIDAR. So the 3D elevation program kind of gives you the authoritative US government data on elevation, at least within the US. If you're looking at other areas, again, SRTM or Aster at 30 meters resolution is probably the way to go. So let's look a little more at this 3D elevation program. This has become the main national elevation data set. It used to just be called the national elevation data set, um, but it's a continuously evolving and improving program where the resolution is expected to get better in different areas over time. So as of now, through this 3D elevation program, 
There's 10 meter resolution data for the US, and this is because of a mixture of different inputs, basically using some of those sources on the last page. In some cases, they're ground truth or mixed with surveyed data to um, improve that data in a given area to 10 meters. Now there's one meter LIDAR for much of the US. As of 2018, about 50% of the US land area has been covered with this one meter digital elevation model. Their goal is a little less in Alaska, it's such a large area that they're not even planning on getting one meter data there. They're hoping to get five meter elevation data in Alaska, still using LIDAR, just slightly lower quality LIDAR. You can take flights over less of the, the land there and use just um, less of a surveying effort to collect that data. So now we're going to look a little more at the properties of one of these DEM rasters. Conceptually, a DEM is always going to be raster data. That means if you look at it from above, um, as we've done before, that raster will have equally sized rows and columns. Each pixel or cell that's created is going to be the same size as each other pixel or cell across the whole data set. And each one of those is going to have just one value, like all rasters do. That one value is going to be height. All rasters, the cells are referred to in terms of their x coordinates and y coordinates. Uh, and that doesn't matter if you're using projected coordinate system or geographic coordinate system. That means either latitude and longitude, that's still kind of an xy data set, or something like meters. If you're using projected coordinates, you'll have um, eastings and northings. Those are the xy coordinates of your data. With a DEM raster, we have that value for each of the cells. The value is elevation. Elevation is described as the Z dimension. So values of the raster cell um, are called the Z values for that cell. So looking at these examples on the right, we basically have the side view of a specific raster. Just look at the top one right here. This is an area of one meter vertical resolution. That means that as you go up in elevation, that elevation can vary by one meter at a time. So here we have those Z values compared to the actual elevation of the landscape in that location. That red line is the actual real world elevation. It kind of varies a little more continuously. There's some small ups, small downs, but when you're portraying that as Z values or this value for data encoded in the raster cell, uh, you have to round these values based on what the resolution is. So in this case, we have an area that is marked as one meter. So basically everything over zero is considered one meter. After we get over one meter, everything is considered two meter. So that's the Z value for that cell. Those first few cells, if we looked at the top view, they would show the number one. Those later cells would show the number two. So like there are also Z values that indicate how high the elevation is in a given spot, there's also these values for vertical resolution. We have horizontal resolution, that's the uh, sides of a cell in a raster. So we talk a lot of times about like 30 meter resolution means there's a cell that's 30 meters by 30 meters in the X and Y directions. That 30 by 30 resolution raster could have a vertical resolution of one meter. So that's shown again in that top image at right. One meter of vertical resolution means that the Z values vary by one meter at a time. You could also have higher or lower vertical resolution. With 0.25 meter vertical resolution, that means we're more sensitive to changes in the environment. We can represent smaller changes in each of those cells more effectively. So in this case, the horizontal resolution is the same. If we were looking down on these two different examples, they still might be 30 by 30 horizontal resolution. However, there's more possible values for the uh, Z value, for that vertical elevation value. So at the, looking again at the far left, we might have a value of 0.25 for the Z value or elevation. And on the far right of this slide, we might have 1.5 for that final value instead of two. So you get more sensitivity if you have higher vertical resolution. If you have one of these data sets with lower vertical resolution, it would be good for looking at larger areas, something like the state or county level. If you derived slope and aspect from that, and then looked at it in a very um, small area or large scale area, it might not give you very good results. They might not be very sensitive to actual changes in the landscape. So if you're looking at a relatively flat construction site, for instance, and you have one meter vertical resolution, the whole place 
might be shown as being at the same elevation even when there's like you know a change in elevation that's within a meter that could be important for looking at like where water drains off of that area so a sign of inadequate vertical resolution or poor vertical resolution is the appearance of unexpected flat areas in your data if you know in the real world there's some variance of the relief there's like upslopes and downslopes but in your digital elevation model it's shown as one set of values across the landscape then you probably want higher vertical resolution value in reality the surface might have a gentle slope but the low vertical resolution results in areas that are just flat and then kind of a jump up to a higher area um, and then another flat area above that and this gets really important when you're considering things like flowing water which we'll look at a little bit later hydrologic models or models of flowing water need better vertical resolution so flow doesn't just get stuck if you're trying to predict where water flows and if there's really like a continuous down slope but it's shown as this flat area like in the top picture in the slide right here um, that's going to be inaccurate and it's going to affect your flow model significantly and one more worthwhile concept to understand when talking about these characteristics of DEMs is z-factor correction when units differ, so if you have like meters in one of your input layers, feet in another of your input layers, for analysis methods, you have to have the same units or you have to convert those units. And you do that using what's called a z-factor correction. So it's kind of like running a tool on a raster, like one of those uh, local analysis tools or neighborhood tools. When you're running a tool on a DEM, this is usually prompted as part of that tool using that elevation data asking if you want to correct for the types of units that you're using as alluded to earlier raw DEMs that you might download have to be processed when you're collecting data from a satellite or from a, a space shuttle there are a lot of errors that can arise in that data so they often have random errors that are called sinks or pits or else peaks these are two different things a sink or a pit is a cell that's lower than all surrounding areas um, and this is a type of error that can arise either in that data collection or an in initial processing of the data a sink is shown in the figure to the right over here um, in this case the elevation is coded by color and these red areas are the lowest elevation there's a red area that's totally surrounded by orange areas which are of a higher elevation this probably isn't something that exists in the real world usually Low elevation areas uh, connect to high elevation areas in a kind of se sequential way. There's not very many cases in the real world where there's just like a hole in the midst of a landscape because of natural processes that would fill in over time. So if you get a sink or a pit, like this example on the right over here, you'd have to address that by filling it. You can also get kind of the opposite error type, which is a peak. And this is where you have cells that are higher than all surrounding cells. And this is more likely to occur in the real world, but a lot of times it can just be like an unrealistic peak where one particular pixel is shown much, much higher than the surrounding landscapes in an unrealistic way. Sinks have more of a potential to be especially problematic when you're looking at things like hydrologic modeling or looking at how water flows over a landscape. If you have just a random hole in the middle of a landscape, all that water running over the nearby landscape is going to fall into that sink or fall into that hole which if that sink doesn't exist in the real world which it probably doesn't um, that's going to be inaccurate and really mess up your model results so a corrected DEM is usually called a depressionless DEM and this is made by filling or down cutting these are two ways to correct these errors running a fill tool on a data set looks for sinks where there's a pixel that's a lot lower than other nearby pixels in your DEM and fills them up to approximately the the value kind of an interpolation of the nearby values you can see this in the figure at the top right the filled sink is filled with that yellow bar in the middle so that the entire elevation or z value for that pixel is close to those surrounding z values peaks also get cut down when you're running this fill tool so the fill tool actually works in both directions um, if you look at the figure in the top right if you run that fill tool there might be a peak this thing obviously looks incorrect it looks like an error or an artifact and if you run the fill tool that gets down cut down again to the level that you'd expect it to be at that makes a more natural progression of elevations sinks are usually errors within your DEM 
but there are actually cases in the real world, some natural landscapes that truly do have sinks. So there's a type of uh, terrain called karst terrain. This is a landscape that's made up of limestone that dissolves really easily. It's a landscape that ends up getting a lot of like caves, sinkholes, features where there's just like dissolved rock that makes these really interesting cave systems. This hillshade map with contour lines drawn on it demonstrates an area that has several actual known sinks. You wouldn't want to fill those in if they actually exist in that area. So you got to make sure you know your field site before doing these things. But for the vast majority of places, a random low point is going to be a sink, not an actual sink hole like you'd find in nature. All right, after a space shuttle or a satellite or an airplane collects this data, after you process it, fill in those sinks, um, you end up with a processed, depressionless DEM, and that's going to look something like this image right here on the middle of the slide. This is Denali. This used to be known as Mount McKinley. It's the highest mountain in the U.S. White areas show high elevations. A pixel with a high elevation is going to have a big number, a big Z value attached to it. These darker pixels are going to have lower values attached to them. They're going to have smaller Z values.